I'll be an explorer, an explorer. And, and the, it guided me. And since I've been here in space, when I see all these planets, the moon, the sun, it's, it's like a ballet and, and it's more, it becomes more familiar. And, 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 I, and I think when I'm, we are in orbit, and, and I think of these astronauts 50 years ago in orbit and, and pushing towards the moon, and it's going to happen again, and, and, and it's going to, it's just around the corner. Bonjour David, Philippe Mercure de la presse. Philippe Mercure. When you are going to leave in a few days, how do you feel? Pardon, j'ai ça a coupé. Sorry, it was cut off. Can you repeat? Je voulais savoir quand vous allez quitter la station, avez-vous l'impression que ça va être un au revoir ou un adieu? Bref, êtes-vous vers une autre mission plus tard? When you're going to leave the station, is it going to be a goodbye or a uh, just a, a short goodbye or forever goodbye? Excusez-moi, je vais demander de répéter encore. Sorry, can you repeat once again? Alors, David, la question était, est -ce so the question was, when you're going to leave the station, is it going or a short goodbye or a forever goodbye? Are you preparing for another mission? On part toujours d'ici. Well, we always leave here saying forever goodbye because we do not decide as representatives uh, for our uh, countries here as operators to, to be part of a mission. We are not uh, the ones who decide that. So it's wiser to uh, leave saying uh, goodbye forever. And then what the future holds for us, of course, we do not know. So it, it was such an adventure. It's, it's, it's easy to uh, close my eyes and come back vi virtually like in a dream. Thank you, David. That's the, the only time we have uh, for you. We'll say goodbye. See you soon and uh, welcome back to Earth very soon. Thank you, every, everyone. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. That concludes the event. Thank you, Canadian Space Agency and participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication.
So I was here today speaking to the uh, Excel Academy, and it's an all-girls school here in Washington, D.C., and it was really great to come talk to them about my mission on board the ISS and the space program, and more importantly, how girls can get involved in STEM. When I was little, probably about their age, I remember shuttles launching over and over, and I became fascinated with watching these shuttles launch. And my parents saw this, and they came up to me and said, hey, are you interested in working for NASA someday? I said, yeah, I think I want to be an astronaut. So the advice that I give young girls is pay attention to those who are living and working around you. If you see a field, especially in science, chemistry, physics, engineering, medicine, there's so many fields in STEM that you think you might be interested in, go up and talk to that person. Go and bother them. Ask them about what they do. Don't be shy. I think it's hard for young girls because we're very shy and we don't get to, we don't want to go up and talk to people because we're we feel like we're bothering them. But I tell girls this age to go ahead and bother. Man, I love this job. Number one, certainly after flying on Expedition 56 and 57, all the tremendous science we did on orbit, certainly a lot of science that actually helps humanity, everything from research on cancer to Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. But man, I get to float everywhere in my line of work, at least when I'm on board the space station, and there's nothing cooler than that. Hey, you're watching NASA TV, on the air and online, every day, on this planet and beyond.
From the furthest reaches of our solar system, to the storms of Jupiter, to asteroid sample collection, NASA's New Frontiers program was created to tackle specific questions about our solar system, deemed top priorities by the planetary community. The first of these missions, New Horizons, launched in 2006, still provides groundbreaking scientific data today. New Horizons was humanity's first encounter with Pluto and its moons, uncovering that this dwarf planet is a dynamic world unlike anything ever imagined. But New Horizons didn't stop there. In 2019, this intrepid spacecraft visited the most distant object ever explored by humankind, named 2014 MU69, beginning the exploration of the mysterious Kuiper Belt, a region of primordial objects that holds keys to understanding the origins of our solar system. The second mission, Juno, has been unlocking Jupiter's secrets and sending us breathtaking images since 2016. By studying the planet's atmosphere, interior, and magnetic fields, Juno continues to improve our understanding of the solar system's beginnings, revealing the origin and evolution of Jupiter. Next up was OSIRIS-REx, a mission that arrived at near-Earth asteroid Bennu in 2018. OSIRIS-REx will directly sample an asteroid and return the sample back to Earth in 2023. The team will use state-of-the-art labs on Earth to analyze the sample, which will help scientists understand the possible building blocks of life, as well as improve our understanding of asteroids that could impact Earth. And today, we announce our next mission to explore our solar system. NASA is pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and expanding the limits of technology. Today, I am proud to announce that our next New Frontiers mission, Dragonfly, will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Dragonfly will be the first drone lander with the capability to fly over 100 miles through Titan's thick atmosphere. Titan is unlike any other place in our solar system and the most comparable to early Earth. The instruments on board will help us investigate organic chemistry, evaluate habitability, and search for chemical signatures of past or even present life. This revolutionary mission would have been unthinkable just a few short years ago. A great nation does great things. We will launch Dragonfly to explore the frontiers of human knowledge for the benefit of all humanity. Hello, welcome to NASA Science Live, your opportunity to go behind the scenes at your nation's space program. I'm Gray Hautaloma and I'm your host for today's special edition. We've all just heard the great news that Dragonfly has been selected to visit Saturn's moon Titan, the next mission in our New Frontiers program. Now let's get a little context about that from our head of the science mission director at Thomas Serbukin and Dr. Lori Glaze, head of our planetary science division. Hey, I'm Thomas Serbukin, associate administrator for science. And I'm Lori Glaze, I'm the director of planetary science division at NASA. And we're so excited to have selected Dragonfly to go forward as the next New Frontiers mission. It's the science that really motivates us to do this exciting and difficult mission, a mission that has elements of advanced instrumentation, but also has the ability of flying in that uh, atmosphere of, of Titan, uh, a world that we, of course, looked at with Cassini and Huygens, our international uh, analysis with uh, ESA and the Italian Space Agency. And what really excites me about this mission is the fact that Titan has all of the key ingredients needed for life, liquid water and liquid methane. We have the complex organic molecules, carbon-based molecules, and we have the energy that we know is required for life. And so we have on Titan opportunity to observe the processes um, that were present on early Earth when life began to form and possibly even conditions that may be able to harbor life today. We may be able to look for biosignatures there today. So what an exciting mission. And of course, that mission is led by principal investigator, Dr. Elizabeth Turtle at uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, but also by a core team that really brought together a very diverse uh, group, uh, close to 40% female, but also an engineering team that brought just now, just a couple of years ago, brought together the Parker Solar Probe, a very hard technological uh, challenging mission. I uh, brought that together uh, below cost and on schedule. So we're really excited uh, to see what's going to happen here. Go Dragonfly. Go Dragonfly. 
Thanks, Thomas and Lori. They really wanted to be here with us, but they're on another continent right now. But we do have a lot of really interesting people with us today, and they're going to be able to answer your questions, so please send them to us. Use the hashtag AskNASA on Facebook and Twitter, or leave a comment in the box at whatever platform you're watching this on. Right now, I've got Kurt Niebuhr with me. He is the lead program scientist for New Frontiers, and he's going to tell us a little bit about why Titan is such a great place for us to visit. Welcome, Kurt. So let's get on right with that. Why, why do we want to go to Titan? Uh, thanks, Ray. You know, Titan is, is a really fascinating place. It, it's the only moon in our solar system that has a thick atmosphere. It's actually thicker than, than Earth's atmosphere. And it's a fascinating place because in this atmosphere, uh, there are chemical reactions going on that actually cause organic molecules, very complex organic molecules, <clears throat> to be formed. And then they, they drift down out of the atmosphere to the surface, almost like a light snow that's always forming. And it's that kind of complicated uh, organic synthesis that really drives our interest toward Titan. As, as Thomas mentioned, we, we've been there before with the Huygens probe. Uh, what did that tell us? The, the Huygens probe was provided by, by the European Space Agency, and it was a, a really tremendous mission. It was delivered by the Cassini spacecraft, and Huygens was the first probe to descend and land on Titan. And we're actually going to land Dragonfly near that location. And what Huygens did was tell us what the atmosphere is like, what kind of properties and conditions we can expect, and even to a limited extent what the surface was like. We would not be able to do the Dragonfly mission if Huygens had not provided the data that it provided. It's kind of mind-blowing to think that we're going to the moon of another planet. The first time we've ever done something like that, landed and flo flying around like this. So tell us a little bit more, why is it such an interesting target for scientists? Well, you know, in, in addition to that, that organic haze that, that's snowing down, uh, Titan has what we call a methane cycle. You know, Earth has a hydrologic cycle where clouds form with water vapor and they eventually condense and, and it rains. Titan has something very similar to that, except instead of liquid water, it's liquid methane. Uh, sort of like the, the liquefied natural gas that's in your propane tank for your barbecue grill. And this actually forms clouds in Titan's atmosphere. And, and it, it also uh, comes together in storms, rainstorms that then carve the surface and create lakes and rivers and canyons. And, and even though it's very cold on Titan, it has a lot of similarities to Earth in that respect. Yeah, so it, it sounds like there are a lot of features on Titan like Earth, like rivers, mm -hmm. lakes. So if we were with Dragonfly on the surface, I mean, would we recognize it? Or is it like such an ancient Earth-like atmosphere? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know what we're looking at. Oh, I think we would definitely recognize it. One of the great things about Dragonfly is with the cameras that it has looking forward and downward, as Dragonfly is flying over the surface, it's going to be taking pictures and sending those back to Earth. So we will actually get the experience as if we were riding along with Dragonfly, looking down at this, this alien yet very fami familiar kind of surface that has these rivers and mountains. And I think that's going to be a tremendous experience for the public, and I think everybody's really going to enjoy it. So this atmosphere, it's a lot thicker than Earth, and that's really essential to what uh, Dragonfly is going to do. So that contributes like, to the methane cycle and, and the snowing of organics. T tell us a little bit more about that whole process. That, that is one of the most exciting things that, that the Cassini mission really revealed to us, is, is how truly complex uh, Titan is with that with that methane cycle where you get the rain coming down collecting into really large lakes like the size of Earth's Great Lakes uh, filled to, to great depth with, with all this liquid methane a and it really creates that kind of weather cycle just like we have on Earth but just without the liquid water a and I should point out that the temperature on Titan is about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit so that is one key difference uh, but even so we have, because of that methane cycle, all those similarities that I, I think will make Titan look a lot like you, you'd experience when you're flying across the surface of Earth in an airplane. So <laughs> why is our ultimate destination this Selk Crater? What, what do we want to see there? Well, we're first going to land in, in some sand dune areas uh, because that, that's a safe place to land and also because we have a lot of science questions about them. But you're right, the ultimate goal is to get to Selk Crater, which is a really large crater on Titan. It's about 50 miles across, and we want to get there because we think that at Selk Crater, the three ingredients you need for life uh, were mixed together, and that mixing is very important because when that impactor came in, it created a lot of debris and mixed them all together. 
So we want to get Dragonfly to that crater so we have a chance to directly investigate what happens when you mix those three things together. Because the great thing about Titan is it's very similar chemically to, the, to Earth before life evolved. And we can't go back in time on Earth and learn the lessons uh, about the chemistry that eventually led to life. But we can go to Titan and we can pursue those questions and look at that chemistry and get a glimpse into what those conditions were like that eventually led to life on Earth. So Selk is kind of the holy grail, but it's got more than two dozen flights before it gets there. So there's a whole variety of things it's going to be getting. What are some of the other samples and things that all these great instruments are going to be taking? We'll spend a lot of time first going over those those sand dunes, which are similar to some of the dunes that you see in Namib, the Namib, Namib area in Africa on Earth. They're rather tall. They're 100, 200 meters tall. There's a few miles between each, each of those dunes. So what we'll do is we'll actually fly Dragonfly over one or two or three of those dunes. We'll land in a smooth, flat area between them. And that's when we can do our analyses to try to understand what are those sands made of? Uh, are, are they composed of those organics that drift down from the atmosphere? Have they been modified in some way? Have they been blown for long distances? And, and I think that'll be a very exciting part of the mission. So why do we call Titan an ocean world? What does that mm -hmm. mean? And I know we call, there's several that we call ocean worlds. How does it compare? Yeah, ocean worlds are, are a really exciting development in planetary science over the past 10 or 15 years. Earth is, of course, an ocean world because we have an ocean at the surface. But on worlds beyond Earth that lack atmospheres, you don't see oceans on the surface. You typically see them below the surface, like on Europa. What we're seeing with, what we're seeing with worlds like Titan and with Enceladus is they also have oceans below their surface. In Titan's case, perhaps 100 miles below the surface. Uh, and that has great implications for life because liquid water is one of the ingredients for life as we know it. And what Dragonfly will do is let us know uh, if that ocean is close enough to the surface to mix with all those complex organic molecules that are falling out of the atmosphere. And if so, that means that we have more ingredients that are mixing together that could lead to life. Well, thanks a lot, Kurt. We're starting to get a lot of questions on social media, so we're going to turn to them. Uh, if you're just tuning in, just want to point out that we're talking about a mission to Titan, Saturn's moon that NASA has just selected today and announced. And uh, if you want to ask a question, go to use the hashtag AskNASA on Facebook or Twitter, or leave a comment on whatever platform you're watching this on. So uh, from Twitter, at Ted Curiosity wants to know what is the expected lifespan of Dragonfly? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, once we land, we will spend about two and a half years flying around Titan. Uh, and we'll do, as you said, a, a couple dozen flights. Uh, and that will allow us to go about 180 kilometers so that we can get to Selk Crater. At uh, C3LT Games wants to know, will Dragonfly have wheels or tracks, or does it only have propellers? Uh, it only has propellers. It has skids underneath so that we can land on those skids. But anytime we want to move, we'll be using those propellers to fly. Some of those flights will be you know, eight or nine miles long. But it could be that we, once we land, we decide we just want to move 10 feet in that direction or, or 50 feet in that direction. And we can do that as well. And that's the great beauty of dragonflies. Because what we've learned when we go to other worlds is if you can move around, if you have mobility, you can learn a lot more because there's nothing more frustrating than spending a year or 10 years trying to get somewhere and you land and you realize, oh, I wish we were 10 feet over in that direction. Dragonfly can make that come true. Wow. YouTube is with us and Aura Master wants to know what rocket is going to be used to send Dragonfly to Titan. That's a good question, and once we get closer to the launch date, we will actually take a look at what kind of performance we need, and then we will uh, go ahead and look at what rockets are available and make a final selection. But we don't do that till we're about three years from the launch date. And it, it's a long flight. It's like going to be about eight years, and we're going to use a gravity assist. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to launch in 2026, and we'll get there in 2024. I'm sorry, sorry, 2034. So it is a long flight, and and that's that's the curse of of exploration in the outer solar system. It, it always takes a long time to get there. Mm. Uh, but we will do a gravity assist of Earth, so uh, once Dragonfly leaves, it'll come back for one final goodbye before it heads out to Titan. We've got uh, one more question right now from at Jeffrey on Twitter. 
Uh, is Titan geologically active? Ah, uh, that is a great question. Uh, and that is something that, that we're debating quite a bit. It's geologically active in the sense that that methane cycle in the rain is, is carving new rivers, it's collecting in, in lakes. And one of the questions we've been debating is, are there cryovolcanoes on Titan? Uh, and what I mean by cryovolcano is instead of erupt erupting lava, molten rock, uh, on places like Titan where it's so cold, the lava is replaced by liquid water. Because when you're at minus 300 degrees, water ice is like granite. And when you have a cryovolcano, that water ice gets melted and behaves like lava. And we've had a lot of debates whether or not Cassini has seen evidence of cryovolcanoes on Titan. And what we're, what, it's still an open debate. Uh, but what we're hoping is Dragonfly, when it gets closer to Selk Crater, will actually be able to sample some of those cryolavas from the impact and see how that liquid water is mixed with the surface materials. Wow, this is going to be a great mission. We're going to take more questions later in the show, so keep sending them at uh, hashtag ask, ask NASA. But uh, right now we're going to go to the Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, which is the home institution of our uh, principal investigator of Dragonfly, and uh, Sophia Roberts is going to start talking to her, and we're going to find out a lot more about the actual spacecraft. Here you go, Sophia. Thank you, Gray. Yeah, we are at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and I'm here with the principal investigator, Zibby. Thank you for bringing us here to the birthplace of this amazing mission. Thank you, our pleasure. Oh, and I'm sure you're so excited, just having found out yesterday <laughs> that this is going to be the next New Frontiers mission. We're absolutely thrilled and ready to jump on in and get, uh, get going to uh, go to Titan. All right, so now we can talk about the hardware of this. This is a one-fourth scale yes. model of Dragonfly, right? Yes. So let's describe actually how what size this is here. Absolutely. So, right, so this is a one-fourth scale model. So Dragonfly is the size of a Mars rover. It stands, it stands you know, about this high, and it's about 10 feet long. So uh, we're used to drones that are, you know, small things that we fly around in our, uh, in our backyards. Um, Dragonfly is really a Mars rover-sized drone that will be able to fly from place to place on Titan. Wonderful. And what are you hoping to get out of this mission? What's sort of the end goal? Well, Titan is... Um, is just a, a perfect chemical laboratory to understand prebiotic chemistry, the chemistry that occurred before chemistry took the step to biology. We know that Titan has rich organic material, very complex organic material on the surface. There's energy in the form of sunlight, and that's what drives this really complicated chemistry in the atmosphere. And we know there's been liquid water on the surface in the past. And so these ingredients that we know are necessary for the development of life as we know it are sitting on the surface of Titan. They've been doing chemistry experiments basically for hundreds of millions of years. And Dragonfly is designed to go pick up the results of those experiments and study them. All right, let's take a tour of what we've got here. Can you just show us what we're looking at? Absolutely. So, uh, right, so this is the, the one-fourth scale model of Dragonfly. Most of the instruments, because Titan is very cold, most of the instruments are actually inside the body of the lander, protected from the environment. You can see here, for example, there are a couple of windows. This is where our forward-looking cameras look out. There are windows underneath where we have downward-looking cameras because we'll be able to take images on the surface as well as in flight. We have um, up here, this is, this is the high gain antenna. This is how we communicate, how we'll send data directly from the surface of Titan back to us on Earth. And these two boxes here on the high gain antenna are two more cameras because the, can the antenna allows us to move those cameras around. The antenna is designed to be able to move, to point toward Earth so we can communicate. And that means that we can use these cameras on the high gain antenna to point around to take a panorama of the terrain surrounding the lander at the different landing sites. The, um, the features here on the, the skids, we have two drills. There's a drill on each side. You can see the drill here behind a cowling. Because Dragonfly flies, we're not used to having to do this for space flight, but because Dragonfly flies, we actually have to think about aerodynamics. And so we've got protection to make sure that we don't have a lot of drag when we're flying. And um, these two drills feed a pneumatic system, basically like a vacuum cleaner, that they can drill down into the surface, and there's a, a, um, we can suck the material up into wow. the uh, mass spectrometer to measure its composition. 
So the mass spectrometer sits here inside the lander, and then there's another way we can measure the compositions of surface materials, and that's the um, gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And with that, we can actually measure the composition of the material surrounding and underneath the lander. So we get very high, um, very fine measurements of the chemistry at very local landing sites and then we, at the very local sampling sites. And then we also get the bigger picture of the chemistry around the lander and underneath. And we can actually sense down to a few tens of centimeters that way. So this is a machine that's going to sort of pulse send a, yes. a little pulse of energy. Yes. So usually when we have uh, gamma ray neutron spectrometers in, in flight, we, um, we can use the cosmic rays um, as sources, but the atmosphere of Titan shields us from that. So we actually have to bring a neutron generator with us mm. to send out the neutrons so that we can receive the information back from the, the subsurface to be able to sense the different materials in the subsurface. All right, I'm looking at this here, and I think it's so unusual that we were able to have a flying device here. So can you talk a little bit why we have, what, eight rotors on this? Why did you choose to fly yes. instead of roll? Yes, so flying on Titan is actually easier than flying on Earth. The atmosphere is four times denser at the surface than the atmosphere on at the surface of Earth. And the gravity is about a seventh the gravity here on Earth. So it's actually easier to fly on Titan. If you put on wings, you'd be able to fly on Titan. So it's the best way to travel, and it's the best way to go long distances so that we can make measurements in a variety of different geologic environments. And that's what we want to be able to do, to understand how the materials on the surface have interacted in different ways. Wonderful. So much more science, which is all that we want, right? Absolutely. All right, let's take a look again back here, because we've got some more parts, perhaps, behind here. What are we looking at right Yeah, so this, this is, um, Dragonfly is designed to use an MMRTG, that's a multi-mission radioisotope uh, thermal electric generator. It's the same kind of power system that the Mars Curiosity rover is using. Um, and so we use this to charge a battery, and then all of our activities are performed off of that battery. So when we fly, um, we, we fly off the battery, and then when we land, we can recharge from the uh, MMRTG, simply because there's not enough sunlight that gets to the surface of Titan that far out in the solar system to be able to do solar power. Is there something that you are really eager to tell the public about this mission? The, the thing... Oh, there's so many things. There's so many things. Um, the one of the things that um, is uh, particularly exciting about this mission is that we can do the very detailed chemical measurements, but be able to put them in the context of Titan as a system, so that we understand the way the materials interact, the way they have been mixed together. We have, um, in addition to the cameras and the, the, the instruments that measure the composition of Titan, we also have an atmospheric, a meteorology suite, um, so we can measure the atmosphere, understand how the atmosphere changes day to day, for example. And we have a seismometer, and that will let us listen for Titan quakes to understand if you know, the level of se seismic activity on Titan and potentially to measure the thickness of the ice shell over the deep interior liquid water ocean. You know, the way all of you on this mission are talking about this, it sounds so much like we're talking about a planet, but just to remind all of you, this is a moon we're speaking about, which is incredible. I mean, it's got rivers, it's got an atmosphere, and it's still just orbiting Saturn, <laughs> which, I mean, how wonderful is that to be going out there? Absolutely. Titan is a, a very Earth-like place, despite the fact that the materials are very different at this very low temperature, um, and the, the bedrock is water ice, and the sand dunes are made of organic sand grains, and the liquid water, or the liquid on the surface is liquid methane, despite the fact that these are very different materials than we're used to the environment that they have made, that they've created on Titan, is incredibly Earth-like, and it has a very familiar feel. All right, let's talk really briefly about that environment. What is it landing into? What does that look like? So uh, Dragonfly, the initial landing site is in the, uh, the equatorial dunes. San Titan has this, these vast sand seas, basically the largest Zen gardens in the solar system, wrap around almost the entire equator equatorial region on Titan. And so Dragonfly will land within these dunes in the interdune regions. Um, and 
Although the materials are very different, this is actually very similar to some of the regions that we have here on Earth. So there's a, a very good analog for the, um, the Titan longitudinal dunes that we'll, we'll be visiting um, in the Namib Desert, um, where we have, uh, have dunes that are very similar, except they're made of silicate and a lot, more, war a lot warmer. <laughs> All right, I think it's about time to go for some questions with Ask NASA. So if you guys have questions out there, please use the hashtag Ask NASA and put it in the comment wherever you're watching or on Twitter. So I'm gonna go take a look at what we've got going here. So Tom83 on Twitter is asking, are we going to be get, able to get high quality pictures? Yes, we'll have a suite of cameras that will take images at different resolutions. Uh, we'll be able to take images of the entire landing site, the entire surrounding of the lander. We have um, the ability to image forward and downward. Um, and then we have very high resolution uh, cameras underneath the lander that will image the, uh, I'll turn it a bit, that will image the actual site where we're sampling at very high resolution. And so we'll be able to get the context at different scales with the, uh, um, with the, um, with the, the camera system. One of the things that's really fun, um, because we have dunes on Titan, one of the things we really wanna study is the, um, the way the sands move. How much wind do you need for the sands to move on Titan, for example? And we don't need to wait for it to for it to be a, you know for there to be a breeze. We can actually turn a rotor and do an active experiment wow. with the sand that we're landed on. Just and we one can, rotor at a time. Exactly. Or? Exactly. And then we can use the cameras to look down at that area and watch and see how much it took to make the sand move. And that will help us really understand the transport of these organic materials across Titan. I'm so excited to see these pictures come back. Too bad it's a few years away. <laughs> we have to wait a little bit to be patient. All right, so from Periscope, we have Cyril Lampart asking, is there a fixed flight plan and key areas of exploration, and what do you expect? Yeah, so we've, we've, Cassini has done a lot of work for us to scout the area that we'll be landing in. We initially land in the sand dunes so that we have access to this, this very rich organic material um, in the, the sand dunes themselves and the sand particles themselves. And then we will traverse over the ejecta blanket of the impact crater and down into the impact crater. So we have information from Cassini um, at the high level about the, the nature of the surface um, and what we may encounter Counter, but what we want to be able to do, of course, is explore that at, the, at, at high resolution in situ um, at, the, at a much more human scale. All right. So Jeff Polk on YouTube is asking, will methane rain on Titan pose any threat? Um, so we have thoroughly tested um, the system to make sure that is not a threat um, in terms of the, the flight system. At, at this time on in Titan's year, we don't actually expect rain at the low latitudes. Titan's year is, um, because Titan has a, or because the Saturn system has a, an axial tilt similar to Earth's, Titan has very similar seasons. And so the, at, at, uh, in northern winter, the North Pole is unilluminated by the sun, sim the same way we have here on Earth, except that Titan's year is 29 and a half years long. But because Cassini was able to observe 13 years of um, in, the t in the Saturnian system, we, it's almost half a Titan year. And so we know how the weather patterns changed seasonally. And because we're gonna be landing basically one Titan year after the Huygens probe descended at a similar latitude, we know what the atmosphere is like and that, it's, um, that at that time of year, uh, the uh, weather systems are actually at the South Pole. All right, Lily Carr too is asking, will Dragonfly be able to transmit video? Well, we'll take a series of images. We can put those together um, as, as, you know, as a series of, of images, um, but it won't be the same kind of high, you know, <laughs> HDTV that, we're, uh, that we uh, might want to be able to see because we're transmitting directly from the surface of Titan to Earth. But we will be able to put together a series of images in a sequence. All right, that'll be good enough, I yep. guess. <laughs> we'll be getting images from the surface of Titan. <laughs> it'll be, it'll from, be good. <laughs> from Twitter, we have at Mr. Coggle is asking, can Dragonfly land on hills or mountainous areas? Um, so Dragonfly is designed um, to fly autonomously 
and to land autonomously. And so we have a, a hazard navigation system. Some of the windows um, here are part of that navigation system. Um, and so we would be able to detect uh, slopes that are too steep, for example, to land on, um, and then navigate to a flatter landing site. So we can land on, on uh, some degree of slope, but we can make sure that we always find an area that is a lower slope to land on. All right, and the guy man on YouTube is asking, who manages this mission? The mission is managed by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory here in Maryland. All right, and then from Periscope, Corey J. Turner is asking, is this a final design or will it be tweaked before the launch in 2026? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, um, what we've done is the initial mission concept. We've demonstrated that the, uh, that the concept closes, as we say, that, this is, that the design um, is robust to the uh, environment that we understand. As we move forward with the development of the mission, there will absolutely be design tweaks, modifications, um, as we start to build the, the different units together. Um, the fundamental design of Dragonfly, we would expect to say very much the same, but there will absolutely be modifications, perhaps a little more aerodynamic uh, shape, for example. Um, I, think the, uh, I think the Rotorcraft team would appreciate that. Well, we're all sitting on our seats excited about this. And before we go off to our next section, I just want to remind you that here in this front area, we have the mass spectrometer. And, and I hear that we have a great model of that back in the studio. So, Gray, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, ladies. So, as they, as Zippy mentioned, the, the model she was just showing you was a one-quarter scale model. Uh, the actual vehicle is much larger. What you see here is a full-scale model of that mass, mass spectrometer that sits at the front nose uh, of, of Dragonfly. And it's in a place called the attic, so it's, a, it's at the top. You heard us talk about how cold Titan is, and we keep all the electronics inside Dragonfly so we can keep them warm, except for this area up here, uh, which I'll talk about. But the mass spectrometer is there so we can get uh, compositional data to, to tell us what the surface of Titan is built of. And, and this is an incredibly com complicated and powerful instrument, and it gives you an idea of how large the, the Dragonfly uh, spacecraft is overall because this fills the, in the entire nose of it. So what we do when we take a sample, as Zibby said, we have drills down on the skids of Dragonfly. And what those drills do is, is create a sample, and then we, we suck it through some tubes, just like a vacuum cleaner does, and it gets sucked up here to the front into this round area, which is a sample carousel. And what the sample carousel has is a bunch of different cells here. These tubes are each different sample cells. There's 48 of them. So that sample is delivered into these tubes, and then we can take two different measurements. There's one type of mass spectroscopy measurement that is taken right here. And then the second one is taken here. And this is actually a miniature oven. Because what we do with that sample, that, that ground up dirt or sand, if you will, is for the second measurement, we actually bake it. We heat it up so that it gives off gases. And then the gas chromatograph that is behind here measures the composition of, of those gases. And when we use both of those measurement techniques, it gives us a tremendous amount of information about the composition of the sample, about the, those complex organic materials that, that we were talking about, and also can look for signs of, uh, signs of life. Thanks a lot, Kurt. It's not every day you get to see a life-size model of an instrument that's going to fly halfway across the solar system. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about Saturn's mission Saturn's moon Titan, where we're going to fly. It's NASA's newest mission in the New Frontiers program. And with us is Dr. Kurt Niebuhr, and we also have another team member with us now. Uh, Lene Quick is, is the head of the uh, Science Enhancement Opportunities uh, part of the mission, and that's kind of about uh, getting the new STEM leaders of tomorrow involved in Dragonfly. Dragonfly is really a mission about the future, and uh, so tell us a little bit more about what, about what that is. Yeah, so we are we have the student enhancement option, which is um, a unique uh, a unique opportunity to get students involved um, in Dragonfly science. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to have students come and uh, scientists and engineers and uh, work on the Dragonfly mission uh, throughout the entire life cycle of the mission. So from phase B onward, uh, we hope to have students get experience in real time working on missions and let that be something that they can tap into uh, for later in their careers. 
So, yeah, you kind of answered it a little bit, but why is SOE, as we call it, why is, why is it important? So, SOE is very important because what we want to do is we want to train the next generation of planetary scientists while also uh, broadening the STEM pipeline, and the SOE is the perfect, uh, perfect model to do that. Uh, what we'll be doing um, is just bringing in students from a broad swath of fields, uh, physics, chemistry, uh, biology. I think when, when Kurt and uh, Zibi talked about the interesting science that you could do at Titan, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a laboratory and it's a grab bag of, of different things you can do. And there are so many different disciplines uh, that could come and, and make a great contribution to, to our science. Um, and one thing that we also talked about earlier was that Dragonfly will not be launching until 2026 and then it will reach Titan in 2034. And by that time, a lot of us who are on the mission now will be mid-career or will be late career um, and really what we want to do is train people who can come and who can who can take over and kind of take up the reins um, as far as leadership on our mission and not only on Dragonfly but on other missions um, in NASA's planetary science portfolio in the future. So you're a scientist. Yes. I, I imagine this would have uh, interested you early in your career. It, it would have definitely interested me early in my career. I was uh, my bachelor's degree is in physics, and so I didn't think about uh, planetary science or how what I was learning as a physics major could be applied to you know obtaining a PhD in planetary science until much later. And if if there was a, a something a program similar to the science enha enhancement option when I was in college, it would definitely have been something um, that would have opened my eyes to planetary science science and planetary geology uh, as an exciting field uh, much earlier. Well, thanks a lot, Lene. Thank you. Obviously, this is just a really new announcement, Dragonfly, so we're still getting up and running. There'll be a lot more materials online in the future, so please feel free to check back at nasa.gov, and uh, eventually you can connect with Lene and find out more about how you could get involved with Dragonfly. So we're going to go to some more questions from social media. Again, that's uh, Ask NASA. Uh, use that hashtag on Facebook or Twitter or in the comments box of wherever you're watching this from. And again, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about a really exciting new NASA mission to the moon Titan of Saturn. Uh, David on YouTube wants to know, I think this will be one for you, Kurt, uh, how you make sure Dragonfly won't bring living organisms like bacteria and contaminate mm. Titan? That's, that's something that NASA takes very seriously. We, we call it planetary protection. And we want to be sure of, of two things. First, that, that we don't contaminate what we're going there to study. And, and second of all, we want to make sure that the, insert, that the measurements we take are not contaminated by what we bring along, because we're going there to learn about Titan. We're not going there to learn about the stuff we took along with us to Titan. Uh, so we have, we have processes and techniques we use that clean all of our spacecraft that go to places like Titan where, where we're going to be measuring organics or perhaps looking for life. So we, we make sure the spacecraft are very clean. Sometimes we bake them at high temperatures to kill off anything that we, we might take along with us. And, and in the case of Titan, it, it's not as concerning because we know that once we land, as, as I mentioned, it's minus 300 degrees. Anything we bring along that's alive is going to freeze really quickly. Uh, so even if our cleaning processes fail, uh, we have that to fall back on. Now, we, we've been talking a lot about methane the last couple weeks on Mars and, and now on Titan. Uh, Ayush Capri on Periscope wants to know, what's the difference between methane in Titan versus what we would find on Mars? Well, I, I think the, the big difference is there's a lot of methane on, on Titan. Uh, and what we're seeing at Mars is is very small amounts, and they're still trying to understand what those measurements need, what those measurements mean, and how they vary through time. Uh, but the methane that we're seeing on Titan is very much a natural process; it, it's being given off into the atmosphere. Uh, but the interesting thing is that methane should not stick around; it, it should break apart, and, and so something is replenishing it. And one of the things we want to try to understand, and what Dragonfly will help us understand, is what what is renewing that meth methane? What, it, what is the source of all that methane? And we think it's geologic in nature, not biologic. Uh, but again, that methane as an organic compound can have a role in the pre-biologic processes that we're going to methane to, to investigate. Mm, fascinating. Got one for you, Lene. Uh, at Guigo Soldadino on Twitter wants to know, can students from around the world work on the Dragonfly Project? 
students from around the world work on the Dragonfly Project. I'm sure that we will find a way um, to allow as many people who are interested in working um, on this project to, to, to work with us, of course, with, you know, going along with whatever uh, NASA wants us to do. But we, we're, we're very excited to have students from all different backgrounds um, work with us on this mission. Great. Thanks, Lene. Yeah, a lot of details still to be worked out, but definitely something to get excited about. Oh, here's an interesting one. Uh, for you, Kurt, Orange Builder on YouTube wants to know, will we see images of Saturn in the titanium sky? Oh, that's a good question. A and to be honest with you, uh, I don't know, Lene. Can you see enough of Saturn through the through the clouds and the thick, hazy atmosphere? I'm not sure that you can. I think you may be able to see just a, maybe a, maybe maybe a, maybe a, maybe, a maybe, maybe a faint trace, but I don't think that we'll be able to see much of Saturn at all through the clouds. I think that's stay tuned until 2034. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scott on YouTube wants to know, is there a limit on uh, Dragonfly's flight? Well, the ultimate limit is, is going to be the the, the MMRTG, the, the nuclear power source, because as, as Zibby said, that's what charges up the battery. Uh, but fortunately, the way they have designed this mission, it'll be about eight years uh, after we land on Titan that it gets to the point that that nuclear power source stops providing enough energy for, for Dragonfly to survive the, the cold environment. So that's the, the long limit. Uh, but beyond that, you simply need to worry about different parts or motors wearing out. And fortunately, we're used to that kind of thing at NASA. We, we understand how to design things that need to last for how long they need to last. And I, and I think the great example of that is, is the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity. We needed them to last for 90 days of operation on Mars. They lasted for over a decade. So uh, here, here's a good one from Kinetics SNAFD on Twitter. How long is it going to take Dragonfly to downlink an image from the surface of Titan to Earth? Mm. Uh, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, as, as Zibi said, we have that really large high gain antenna, and, and it is about yay big across. Uh, and we'll be using that not when we're flying, only when we're we're landed. Uh, but I'm not sure what the data rates are going to be. Uh, it, it's it'll probably take several minutes of downlink time to get each image, and, and that's one of the reasons Zibi said we're not going to have movies, high high def movies, while we're flying but we will have enough bandwidth that we can send back successive images, pretty high quality images that are taken while we're in flight. And then you can stitch those together into a movie. Well, we really appreciate both of you guys' time today. That's all we have time for right now as far as questions, but this is not the end. There is a Reddit AMA on Monday at 3 p.m. So if you want to come back and ask some more questions of Kurt and some other folks as well, please do that. Uh, I'm just going to go with one more question with the, each of you guys. Same one. Sure. What are you most excited about, Drake? What am I What am I most excited about? Well, I feel like Kurt set me up for this one by talking about <laughs> cryovolcano, so I'll just go back to that one. Um, I, 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 in my work, I, I model just the eruptions of these, these icy fluids or the slush onto the surfaces uh, of ocean worlds, and I'm used to uh, thinking about worlds like Europa where we have this slush that erupts and it's, it's very young and there's nothing to bother it because there's no atmosphere and there's no weather. Uh, but when we think about Titan, uh, that's a, a different situation. We'll have uh, fluids that may erupt onto the surface and uh, they may, you know, so we may have young surface areas that have been eroded and, and weathered. Um, and that's something that I really haven't, haven't really thought too much about, but I'm excited to have to think about it now. So, yeah, very excited about that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, just as you mentioned, Gray, just the idea that we're going to be flying over an alien world that's circling another planet is mind-boggling to me. And I think as we're skimming across the dunes, the, the pictures we get back from in-flight are gonna be unbelievable. Uh, and, but I think that the real, the real thing that will take our breath away is, is as we're getting close, closer and closer to Selk Crater, and we see that fill the image and get bigger and bigger and bigger as we get closer and closer, I think that is going to excite the entire planet. I think you're right about that, Kurt. This is it for today, but uh, as I said, uh, this is just the beginning. This is going to be a great mission, and uh, a lot of people around the world are going to have chances to be involved with it for many years to come. So again, if you didn't hear me, there is an AMA, a Reddit AMA on Monday at 3 p.m., so please join us for that.